today my topic of presentation is anesthesia management in pericardium cardiomyopathy over the next few minutes i am going to highlight the introduction and incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy then the risk factors and etiopathology for the peripartum cardiomyopathy then clinical features diagnosis and investigation required for the peripartum cardiomyopathy then the management and prognosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy and the anesthesia goals and consideration required in peripartum cardiomyopathy so peripartum cardiomyopathy is a, a disease of unknown etiology it is a, a rare fatal and life threatening disease in the cardiovascular system which is having high mortality and morbidity the anesthesia management of this patient is a complicated and challenging due to the low physiological reserve and potential negative effects on the fetus so definition of peripartum cardiomyopathy is a it is an idiopathic cardiomyopathy presenting with a heart failure secondary to the left ventricular systolic dysfunction towards the end, end of pregnancy or immediately after delivery where there is no other cause of heart failure is found so this is a criteria required for the peripartum cardiomyopathy by de uh, definition first uh, criteria is the onset of heart failure within the 5 months of delivery or in the last month of pregnancy the second one is a heart failure is of no etiology then there is a no obvious cardiac illness before the last month of pregnancy and the fourth one is a, there should be a echocardiographic evidence of left ventricular systolic dysfunction that is ejection fraction should be less than 45 and there should be a reduced fractional shortage by this is the of diagnosis of exclusion so incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy is around 0.1% out of this 16 60% patient within the two months of postpartum presents and up to 7% may present in the last trimester of pregnancy and it is the higher incidence is presented in africa because of having this patient having malnutrition and because of local customs in a perikardium which shows the importance of nutritional deficiency in a patient with peripartum cardiomyopathy so what are the risk factors of the peripartum cardiomyopathy first these are divided into cardiovascular risk factor like the uh, if the maternal age is more than 30 uh, years then essential hypertension obesity diabetes and the other important factors are if the patient is multiparous then multiple pregnancy having twin, uh, twin pregnancy then patient with uh, are having nutritional deficiency like selenium and zinc deficiency and the patient present hypertension disorders are also risk factors then the patient who are taking the cocaine uh, these are also a uh, high risk factors and last one is a uh, if the patient is having hiv there are also chances of peripartum cardiomyopathy in such patients so what is the etiology of the uh, pericardium cardiomyopathy it is uh, the etiology is having uh, multiple mechanical factors which are due to the oxidative response in the cardiomyocytes which causing angiogenesis these are the multiple factors are like inflammation viral myocarditis abnormal immune response then hormonal factors like increasing the prolactin levels then genetic predisposition and other factors are abnormal hemodynamic response malnutrition like zinc and selenium deficiency and apoptosis this oxidative uh, response is perpetuated by all these etiological factors so what are the symptoms of peripartum cardiomyopathy these are uh, like common during the normal pregnancy but we have to assess these symptoms whether these are uh, of uh, normal delivery or if the patient is having peripartum cardiomyopathy like dyspnea fatigue orthopnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea palpitation hemoptysis and peripheral edema and the signs which are uh, present during the peripartum cardiomyopathy are increasing the jugular venous pressure then tachycardia tachyarrhythmias then shifting of the apex impulse then having para, uh, presence of uh, parasternal heave then murmur is present due to the presence of mitral regurgitation or tricuspidal regurgitation and sometimes there are presence of pulmonary trachus and peripheral edema so uh, the uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy is a diagnosis of exclusion so we have to uh, exclude the other di uh, diagnosis which are, which are present like a cardiac failure these are presence of previous di dilated cardiomyopathy congestive heart then hypertension disorders in pregnancy pulmonary heart disease and congenital heart disease so for this we have to uh, do investigation which uh, helps for diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy like chest radiograph is showing cardiomegaly with pulmonary edema then pulmonary venous congestion and ecg is showing sinus tachycardia with non specific st and t wave changes then uh, sometimes there is a atrial or ventricular arrhythmia and condition defects like lbb next one is a brain nitrotic peptide which is normally not present in a pregnancy but it is increased in case of patient having pericardium cardiomyopathy presenting with a cardiac failure then in cardiac imaging 2d echocardiography and cardiac mri is required 
So in eco echocardiography, you can see that there is an enlargement of all four chambers with marked reduction in the left ventricular systolic function. Then there will be a, uh, sometimes mild to moderate pericardial effusion with the mitral or tricuspid regurgitation. Then you can see a ventricle wall regional motion liability and decreased cardiac output. And in some patients, you can see increase in the pulmonary wage pressure also. So what is the uh, prognosis of this patient? This uh, prognosis is uh, depends upon the degree of dysfunction at presentation, which is defined by NIH classification and by trans thoracic echocardiography. So 30 to 50 percent of the patient will improve. And there is an initial risk of mortality around 25 to 50% in first three months of postpartum. The patient with persistent cardiomegaly at six months have reported mortality of around 85% at five years. And death in peripartum cardiomyopathy is either due to intractable heart failure, arrhythmia, and embolism. So subsequent pregnancy in women with peripartum cardiomyopathy is often associated with relapse and high risk of maternal morbidity and mortality. So that's why they, uh, we have to discourage the pregnancy in women with peripartum cardiomyopathy who have persistent cardiac dysfunction. So coming to the management of peripartum cardiomyopathy, the peripartum cardiomyopathy management is like uh, similar to the other treatment of cardiac failure, which includes maintenance of adequate oxygenation, fluid and salt restriction, then ventricular offloading by uh, giving vasodilation and diuretics. The AC inhibitor we can give in a postpartum period, but it is contraindicated in patient with pregnancy due to the risk of birth defect and also ARB is also contraindicated and AC inhibitors and ARBs are uh, not recommended in patients who are having spreading to spreading due to the risk of neonatal hypotension and the cancer channel blockers are also avoided due to the negative anotrophic effect and uh, the tocolytic effects. So coming to the vasodilator therapy, these are hydrolysin and nitrate therapy can be give, uh, given for pregnant uh, to pregnant patient to reduce the after load, preload and intracardiac filling pressures. And beta blockers also given to reduce the tachyarrhythmias. So digoxin is also safe in pregnancy, which is uh, having positive anotrophic effects. And next one is a loop diuretic we can give, which reduces the pulmonary congestion and peripheral edema, which is both uh, safe in pregnancy and lactation. These patients are more prone for neural thrombosis because of low ejection fraction. So there are high chances of thromboembolic event. So that's why we, we need to give anticoagulant therapy, either by giving heparin during pregnancy and warfarin after the pregnancy. Since the disease is maybe reversible, the temporary use of uh, intraortic balloon pump or LV assisted device as a non-pharmacological therapy can be given for such patients. And sometimes in the biopsy, if the patient is uh, showing inflammatory components, we can give bromocyptin and pentazifelin uh, for uh, retractable cardiac failure. So coming to the anesthesia consideration, this patient suspected with pericardial cardiopathy, we have to make a plan for labor in uh, delivery and postpartum care. The mode of, uh, decide the mode of delivery based on the patient obstetric history, like current hemodynamic status and uh, response to the medical management. And interoperatively, we have to see whether the patient is in acidosis, hypoxia or in anemia. So in such patient, vagina delivery can be possible if the patient is having compensated pericardium cardiomyopathy and caesarean section is required if the patient is having decompensated heart failure or if the ejection fraction is less than 25 to 30 percent. So vagina delivery, uh, delivery is the technique to limit the increase in the palm, uh, plasma catecholamines, systemic vascular resistance and myocardial workload associated with labor. We have to prevent the outer cowl compression by avoiding superimposition and in vaginal delivery, consider the early labor repeated anesthesia to limit the cardiovascular stress. And we can manage the second stage of labor with instrumental assistance to reduce the myocardial workload and the detrimental cardiovascular effects of prolonged vascular maneuver. So coming to the cesarean section, the anesthesia goal is to maintain the cardiac grid by maintenance of myocardial perfusion to by avoiding the arrhythmias and episodes of hypotension and tachycardias, then optimize the cardiac output by maintaining preload but prevent the fluid overload, then maintain and increase the myocardial contact rate, and lastly prevent the increase in the afterload. Coming to the neurological and uh, central neurological anesthesia, subrachnoid block should be avoided because of the sudden onset of hemodynamic instability. So, equidural anesthesia is a better choice because of the decrease, uh, it decreases the 
systemic oscillar resistance which reduces the after load on the left ventricle without impairing the contact rate and if you anesthesia should be given in the in incremental doses and the top up of uh, top up uh, of opiates can be added for a, an as adjuvant then coming to the general anesthesia we have to prepare uh, the all antiarrhythmic drugs vasopressors and defibrillator should be ready then transesophageal echocardiography should be done uh, continuously to assess the cardiac function then the induction should be smooth and we have to consider the rapid sequence induction with low dose of opiates if the patient is not having any de uh, decompensation and we can consider the fast acting opiate to uh, like ramipentanil to alternate the pressure response to laryngoscopy and intubation during the general anesthesia the drug dosage must be titrated to facilitate the extubation uh, extubation on uh, instable patient then we can use seoflurin as an inhalation agent because it is a more stable in pregnancy. Then midazolam and short acting opiates can be used after delivery of baby. During the, uh, during the season section, calculate the blood loss, uh, replace the fluid and maintain the euhalumia. If required inotropes, the choice of agent is dobutamide. Then calcium sensitizer like levosimendamon. Levosimendamon is a, uh, used in the doses of 6 to 12 microgram per kg over the 10 minutes. And for maintenance dose, it, uh, it should be used uh, in a doses of 0.2 to 0 0.2 to 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. And uh, phosphodiesterase diesterase inhibitor milidone can be used in a doses of 50 mics per kg over 10 minutes. And in a infusion doses, we can use 0.375 to 0.675 microgram per kg per minute. The next precaution we have to take is avoid the use of heterotonic drugs like oxidation because it decreases the systemic vascular resistance and in higher doses it can cause antidiuretic effects. That's why if you want to use uh, oxidation, you can use in infusion doses. The arbometrin should be avoided because it increases the after load. Coming to the intracardiac monitoring, it depends upon the preoperative signs and symptoms. Like in a symptomatic patient, we can use central pressure, uh, central venous pressure monitoring and non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. And in case of symptomatic patient, the PA catheter monitoring or uh, invasive arterial line monitoring, and if you are available, cardiac output monitoring will help uh, in such patients. Then coming to the post-operative care, it is better to monitor such patient in ICU for hemodynamic stabilization. Patient may worsen due to the retention of water due to antidiuretic effects of oxidation and also because of the reabsorption of third space fluid after 48 hours of the cesarean section. This is because of the increase in the preload which causes, which deteriorates the patient suddenly. So my take home message is peripartum cardiomyopathy is a rare but significant entity complicating the terminal stages of pregnancy. The early diagnosis, continued monitoring and prompt treatment of heart failure can decrease the maternal morbidity and mortality. The decision of anesthesia has to be judged on the patient by patient basis and factor to consider include urgency of surgery as well as prevalent association complication and in all such uh, situation careful intense hemodynamic monitoring and slow and judicious titration of anesthesia drug is important to provide good maternal and fetal outcome this is my uh, references thank you